like to thank Brother Jonathan for reading our scriptural text this morning, which came from the book of 1 Corinthians. The chapter was 15, and the verse was 17. And it is from that passage of scripture that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, the rate of the resurrection. The rate of the resurrection. My brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the heart of our faith established by the scriptures. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 5, that we believe that Jesus died according to the scriptures, that he was buried according to the scriptures and that he raised to life again according to the scriptures. My friends, it is the most essential part of the gospel message that must be preached to a lost and dying world. We see that these were the last words of Jesus in Luke chapter 24, verse 45 through 47, that repentance and the forgiveness of sins must be preached to every soul. For an individual to be saved, they must imitate Christ by obeying from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered unto us according to Romans chapter 6 verse 17, which requires that we die to sin, that we are buried in the watery grave of baptism, and that we are raised from this water into the newness of life. We need to understand that baptism is not a picture of salvation. It is a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we see this as we take a look at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. Knowing the emphasis, knowing the seriousness, and knowing the relevance the scripture places on this specific event in history. When talking to others about the Lord... It almost appears that other aspects of the gospel or the doctrine of Christ seems to take precedence over the resurrection. Now, I do not believe that that this is done because individuals do not think the resurrection of our Lord is unimportant. But I believe that whenever we go into personal Bible studies with people and the first thing out of our mouths is not Christ and him crucified, I believe that may be the case simply because the resurrection is undervalued. Now, if we could place a value on the resurrection, the questions we must ask ourselves this morning are, what would be the going rate? In other words, what would we charge for the resurrection? Or what would be the amount of the resurrection? Or how much would it cost us to purchase the resurrection? We are on a business trip. We are seeking reimbursement of the resurrection. What is the expense? Or we are in the process of selling the resurrection. But before we can sell it, it is necessary that we have the resurrection of praise to determine its monetary worth. What is the market price of the resurrection? My brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, these secular examples as well as rhetorical questions were designed to focus our attention on scripturally discovering the going rate of the resurrection in our own lives. My friends, our faith can either be strong, weak, in vain, or non-existent based upon our conviction regarding the resurrection. This is why Paul has so much to say about this to the Corinthian church. He says, he shares with them throughout this entire letter that you have these problems. You're doing these things. You're saying things and giving information and not living up to the standard of scripture. And why is that? What do you think about the resurrection? 
See, when a congregation tolerates sin, they do it because they have devalued the resurrection. When a congregation is afraid to preach truth and shame the devil, they do that because they have undervalued the resurrection. They don't understand the significance of Jesus getting up. That that is our entire hope. That we should be spreading this message to everyone we come in contact with. And this is why Paul says all of your problems are centered around your misunderstanding of what Jesus actually did for you. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 12 through 34. So on this morning, I would like for us to consider seven truths pertaining to the recognized reality of the resurrection. Truth number one is this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is necessary for our salvation. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is necessary for our salvation. Listen to your Bible in Romans chapter 10. Verse 8 and 9, Romans, the chapter is 10, and the verses are 8 and 9. The Bible reads, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is necessary for our salvation. It is essential for our deliverance from sin. What we see in the text is that Paul quotes an Old Testament scripture. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14, Moses says, but the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. Don't you know that it is from this quote that the Apostle Paul preaches Christ. He tells us that with this word of faith that we must confess that Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is the administrator of our attitudes. It means that he is the chieftain of our conduct. It means that he is the champion of our conviction. It means that he is the director of our decisions. It means that he is the executive of our environment. It means that he is the leader of our lives and he is the owner of our opportunities. He is the supervisor of our sanctification. That's what it means when it says that Jesus is Lord. But not only this, we must believe that our God raised Jesus from the dead. This is what we must know. For if we know this truth and confess this truth according to the scriptures, then we can obey this truth. Moses says, I have given you this word it has been put in your heart and in your mouth so that you can do it. And Paul says, I'm giving you this word of faith, not only that you may confess it, not only that you may know it, but that you may do it and be saved. Nevertheless, everything that has just been said becomes null and void in the absence of Christ's resurrection. So yes, the resurrection is necessary for our salvation, but listen to the second truth. The second truth is that the resurrection of Jesus ensures our justification. It ensures our justification. 
It guarantees it. Listen to your Bible. In Romans chapter 4, verse 23 through 25, Romans chapter 4, verse 23 through 25, the Apostle Paul writes, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, talking about Abraham, but for ours also, talking about the rest of us. It will be counted to us who believe in God, in him who raised from the dead Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. The resurrection of Jesus ensures our justification. It makes certain that the penalty of sin has been removed. Don't you know that when we go back to the Old Testament, we see the prophet Isaiah. And the prophet Isaiah says that our righteousness in the presence of God is nothing more than filthy rags. He says that our righteousness before a holy and just God are polluted garments. We see that in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. Yet we serve a God that has the power to count our good deeds as righteousness before him if we simply have faith in God and in the promises found in his word. Paul tells us in this text that Jesus died to counsel our debt. He also tells us that Jesus not only died, but Jesus was raised. For what purpose? To give us credit for the good we do. So the question is, do we have the faith to believe these facts just Jesus died and rose again from the dead and if we believe that do we by faith accept God's offer of salvation justification sanctification and redemption and so, not only was Jesus raised, his resurrection was necessary for our salvation, not only does it ensure our justification, but our third truth is that the resurrection of Jesus enables us to be fruitful for God. It enables us to be fruitful for God. That if we believe in this resurrection, we will bear fruit for God. Listen to your Bible in Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 6. Listen to what the apostle said. In Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 6, the book says, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What Paul does here is that he is actually making reference to the law of marriage. He, he starts off by saying that for as long as a person's spouse is alive, they are bound to their spouse according to the law. But if that spouse dies and murder is not an option, <laughs> but if your spouse dies, you are no longer bound to that spouse. That's why if that person decides to marry somebody else, they're not called an adulterer 
or an adulteress. And he says, just like you understand that analogy, you have to understand your relationship now with Christ. Before Christ, you was bound to the old way of doing things. But now since you have died to sin and have been bound to Christ, the old things have died. They have passed away. You are now married to another. So just like in the old way you bore fruit to death, you now bear fruit for God. Just like in marriage, everything you did was for your spouse, but now since that spouse is dead, you have married another. That which you do benefits your new spouse. The new way of the spirit. And so, when we look at the resurrection of Jesus and how the resurrection of Jesus enables us to be fruitful to God, what that does is that it empowers us to do good works by the authority of Christ, knowing that our labor is not in vain. See, my brothers and sisters, we bear, we bear inner fruit and we bear outer fruit. We bear inner fruit when we allow God to establish and nurture in us Christ-like qualities. Listen to your Bible in Galatians chapter 5. Verses 22 through 24. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. A very familiar passage of scripture. The apostle Paul writes, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So that's the inward fruit that we bear. But we also bear outward fruit when we allow God to work through us to bring him glory. Listen to your Bible. In Philippians chapter 2, and the verses are 12 and 13. Philippians chapter 2, and the verses are 12 and 13. The Bible reads, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The apostles of Jesus Christ, they even saw every arena of life as an opportunity to bear fruit. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8, when you in your home, that's an opportunity to bear fruit. When you on the highway and someone cuts you off, that's actually an opportunity for you to bear fruit. When you are at the stoplight and you don't move fast enough and someone gives you the finger and beep the horn, that's an opportunity for you to bear fruit. When you go to work every day at a job you don't like and you may be the only light in the room, that is an opportunity for you to bear fruit. Young people, when you go to school and people are waving their hands in the air as if they don't care, that is your opportunity in the schoolhouse to bear fruit. When you are among your friends, when you are among your family, even when you come to worship God in spirit and in truth, all of these are opportunities and areas of life in which we can bear fruit for God. Because the book teaches us that either we are bearing fruit for God or we are bearing fruit for death. But bearing fruit we cannot avoid. The fourth truth about the resurrection is that the resurrection of Jesus energizes the Christian. It energizes the Christian. It is designed that whenever we think about the fact that not even death could keep us in the ground, could not keep Jesus in the ground, it gives us the hope to know that there is no power on earth that can tie us down. It energizes us to keep moving forward, 
to put one foot in front of the other, to keep moving in a positive direction because the Hebrew writer is right. According to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, we are not of them who draw back to perdition, but we believe to the saving of the soul. And so listen to your Bible as we take a look at Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. In Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11, the Bible reads, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus Christ energizes the Christian. It awakens and motivates the impenitent baptized believer in the body of Christ to action and service. And for this reason, there is no such thing as an excuse for non-performance. There is no such thing as an inactive Christian because if we are inactive, then we cannot call ourselves Christians because Christians do not exhibit the characteristics of a dead man. See, the life we now live is to be lived in Christ and it's to be lived for Christ. The fifth truth I want us to consider this morning is found in Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31, because there we learn that the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives evidence that there will be a judgment. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31, the Bible reads, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Again, the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives evidence that there will be a judgment. And if there's going to be a judgment, now is the time for us to tidy our thoughts. According to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14, where, where, where the preacher writes, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or bad. Not only do we need to tidy our thoughts, but we need to wash our words. We hear the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37, where Jesus says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Why? For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Not only do we need to wash our words and tidy our thoughts, but we need to disinfect our deeds. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. The sixth truth about the resurrection is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us security. It's designed to give us security. It's designed to take away our fear, 
to allow us to live life for him without compromise. Listen to your Bible in Hebrews chapter 7 and the verses 25. In Hebrews chapter 7 and the verse is 25, the Bible reads, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. That Jesus always lives to make intercession for us. Don't you know Jesus said in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 through 18, he says, fear not, for I am the first and the last and the living one. Jesus says, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. I believe we sing the chorus of a song because he lives. We can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone for we know that he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. We may not know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. My brothers and sisters, we can rest soundly at night because he lives. We can leave our homes without fear because he lives. We can worship without molestation because he lives. Through the resurrection, he became the answer to our anxiety. He became the bearer of our burdens. He became the confidence to our cares. He became the deliverer of our disappointments. He became the elevator of our errors. He became the freedom, freedom to our fear. And this is why we need to praise his name. And so I want to give the seventh truth of the resurrection. And that is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees our resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees our resurrection. Where is that in the Bible? John chapter 14, verses 18 through 21. In John chapter 14, verses 18 through 21. The Bible reads, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees our resurrection. See, since Christ died, was buried, but did not stay dead, our resurrection is guaranteed. Nevertheless, the life we live will determine what kind of resurrection we receive. Listen to your Bible. In John chapter 5, verse 25 through 29, this verse teaches us that everybody's going to get up on that day, on that great getting up morning. But some are going to rise to life, and others are going to rise to death. Listen to Jesus. In John chapter 5, verse 25 through 29, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tomb will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. 
I want to close this message by going back to the Old Testament. We're about to take a look at Micah chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. But before we read that verse, I just simply want to say that the prophet Micah preached to the people of the southern kingdom, which was known as Judah during the reigns of King Jotham, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. We also know that this minor prophet by the name of Micah prophesied during the times of the prophets Isaiah and Hosea, and around the same time that the northern kingdom, which was known as Israel, was taken into Assyrian captivity. And so when Micah gives his message to God's people in the southern kingdom, his message was simple. His message was a failure to repent will land Judah in the same predicament as Israel. But God is merciful to deliver them from this plight if they will simply turn and wait on God. Don't you know that when Micah prophesies to the people of Judah, he himself uses resurrection language. And he uses resurrection language because the resurrection is designed to give hope. The fact that I can be beat down and I don't have to stay down, I can get up and I can get up by the power of God, that is a message of hope. And so listen to Micah. Micah says in Micah chapter 7, verses 8 through 10, he said, Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out, of, he will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. Then my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look upon her. Now she will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. Here's the moral of the message that has been given today. No matter how devastating our struggles, no matter how destructive our disappointments, no matter how overwhelming our troubles are, they are only temporary. Jesus died, but he only went through that for three days. It was temporary. Lazarus died. He only went through that for four days. It was temporary. And don't you know that whatever it is that you're going through today, it's just temporary. No matter what happens to us, no matter the depth of tragedy or pain we face, no matter how death stalks us and our loved ones, the resurrection of our Lord promises us a future of immeasurable good. So where do you stand this morning? We're about to sing a song, and that song is entitled, Only a Step. This song is speaking about how there's only a step that's keeping you from God's best. But the phrase, only a step, speaks of the opposite in the Old Testament, where David says to Jonathan, there is but a step between me and death. As a result of Jonathan's father Saul attempting to take his life, there's only a step that separates us from death, but there's also only a step that separates you from God. I'm pleading with you this morning to take the step that will lead you to God. That step in the right direction that will save your soul. And stepping is easy. You don't have to be like a kappa when you step. You just have to walk. You've walked in this building. You've already taken the first step to hear his word. Go ahead and take another step and believe what you heard. And then take another step and give up sin. Let it go. I guarantee you it will lighten your load because sin is heavy. Take another step 
open your mouth and confess that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Take another step into the waters of baptism and have your sins washed away. Take another step, walk out the baptistry and rise to the newness of life and continue to walk in the light because if you're walking in Christ in whom there is no darkness, I want you to know that there is no stopping point short of victory. You just have to keep walking, keep stepping, keep doing what God has sent his son to die for you to do, and that is to live for him. Amen. So just keep walking, keep stepping. And maybe you're a Christian, but maybe you've taken some steps, taken some steps back. See, that's called backsliding. That's called backsliding. The only time backsliding was ever considered a good thing is when hip hop started doing that as a dance move called the moonwalk. <laughs> Other than that, you don't need to be doing any moonwalking in the kingdom of God. You need to walk forward, not backwards. You need to put one foot in front of the other and say, I've sinned against you, Lord. I've admit I've done wrong, and I'm just like the prodigal son. And I'm on my way back home. Amen. Take a step and get down on bended knee. Asking the Lord to save this soul of yours. Ask Jesus to forgive you. You're not asking for a second chance or a third chance. You're asking for another chance. Because if you're anything like me, you used up your second and third chance a long time ago. That's why I'm so glad we serve a God that for as long as we have breath in our body and blood in our veins, he can and he will forgive, but we have to take the right step. Yes, sir. Repent. Ask for prayer. Pray that God will forgive you. Ask your brethren to pray with you. Ask the righteous to pray for you. Wherever you are, this morning remember that Jesus died for you he died for your trespasses he died for my trespasses he died for our trespasses but he was raised resurrected for your justification for my justification for our justification take that step and make things right with your God before his eternally and everlasting